Today's Why We Bleep is brought to you by Signal Sounds. If you're in the mood to buy some gear, and aren't you always in the mood to buy some new sweet piece of equipment, it's very helpful to have someone's brains to pick so that you know that sweet piece of equipment is just the right thing for you, musically. Signal Sounds do this. They are an awesome, genuinely awesome retailer up in Glasgow. They have an amazing amount of stuff in stock. Tons of modular drum machine synths and other stuff, including rare things, rare things from all right devices. Epoch Modular, Grayscale, Jaw Analog, Clevis, LZX Industries, who make this video synth that I talk about in a sec, Rabid Elephant, who make a very nice low-pass gate, and Dupfer, never heard of them. Signal sounds ship worldwide and are sound as F. I genuinely mean that. So if you are looking to buy some gear, give them a shout. The website is signalsounds.com. Once again, signalsounds.com. Time to podcast. Why? Oh yeah, how are you doing? You all right? It's been a while, uh, so it's nice to see you again and pull up a chair. Hopefully you've got a bit of time, you don't mind chatting and thinking about synth for a bit. Yeah, I mean, what, I, what have I been up to? Well, I've been been Berlin, that's the thing that's happened. I went for a wedding, but when I was there, that's an opportunity for me to go to synth shops as well. So. <laughs> I was able to go to the excellent patch point um, and Common Ground and spent some time in Common Ground playing with this uh, Vidiot video synthesizer, which is really awesome, the LZX video, which is just fascinates me because video synthesis, especially the like the Eurorack variety of it, I've seen done to amazing effect. Actually, when I played in um, Bristol, there was a really, really awesome uh, video synthesis, synthesizer dude whose name I should discover. Um, but it's just beautiful. It creates these sort of super classic kind of strobing video artifact effects and just has a beautiful kind of sort of analog slash digitally aesthetic, if that is an aesthetic. Um, and so it's fun. That video is like a standalone video synth. So you don't kind of have to, it's like a perfect solution. It's like the sort of no coast where you can just, instead of buying loads of things and getting into a format, you can just buy one box and just then do some video thing. Um, so we had fun with that actually. But before that, I was in this patch point shop, which if you've not been to patch point in Berlin is a very cool place. It's very sort of small, um, like half a workshop because they actually build stuff there. Like I didn't realize they, they're not just a shop. They actually have a workspace and they build, um, Seat Lombard and Surge gear kind of under license as it were. And, and, just to highlight Seat Lombard, holy crap. I don't know if you've come across that gear, but uh, you know, I'm sure that the person who is at Seat Lombard wouldn't mind me speaking in very plain terms about how he comes across in the various interviews, documentaries, other sort of material. The man's name is Peter Blasser, and I, I highly recommend that you pour yourself a glass of whiskey, or indeed... Uh, <laughs> consume a tab of acid and watch Peter Blasser being interviewed and participating in workshops, giving performances and generally engaging with the world of social media because where do you start? The man, the man is basically a walking tab of acid. He's a tab of acid made human and started a small synthesizer business. Man done a lot of acid. But that leads him to these most incredible creative designs. And, and the PCBs themselves are a thing to behold. One of the devices that had its lid off. And the PCBs are like works of art and have got poetry sewn onto them. Like weird sort of, you know, semi-psychotic angry poetry. But yeah, nice place. And just to say, they also had a sausage dog in the shop who was an absolute sweetheart. Um, and me and the sausage dog played fetch, and um, yeah, had lots of pats, very cute. Anyway, 
If you're still here, we've got a person to talk to, which is a guy called Robin Rambo, aka Scanner. Now, Scanner, I would describe as the one of the old guards of electronic music, at least in the sort of modern era. Um, and when I say modern era, I mean from 1989 onwards, basically the the kind of warp early to you know current but early warp records kind of era um, but scan has been going around a lot longer than that he started in 80, 1982 um and i wasn't even alive then um, so uh, he has a thing or two to say the man has um i counted uh, 66 albums on discogs um, and he's done so much more than just release albums he's done installations he creates music for film and for dancing as, as well dance and kind of theater he's done music you know applied music far beyond the album sort of space um but yeah as a sort of an electronic musician in his own right um in the sort of more in the recorded world he's just done so much stuff i mean and notably like one of his earlier things in 1994 he was on artificial intelligence too um, and was the final track, closing out a record that included um, such a, a completely forgettable people as B12, Kenny Larkin, or Tekka, uh, and someone called Polygon Window? Never heard of him. Don't think that guy will amount to much. Um, but yeah, Scanner. I've met him a few times before at sort of synth events. I sort of first met him at um, Ross Lamond's uh, event in Peterborough, and, and you know, Robin is just such a nice guy. Um, he's like one of the most humble and sort of chatty and unassuming sort of synth blokes I know. He's just he's just a very good conversationalist, which is going to be readily apparent because we have a, a really big conversation. And we talked about a million different things. Um, you know, uh, what do we talk about? So like... Um, early music, as in his early experiences with music, making tape loops. We talk about memory. We talk about music process. We talk about converting electronic scores into orchestral scores and sort of problems of that, scanning the radio, old school mobile phones, um, technology in general. Um, we talk about completely bombing live gigs, um, about working spaces, about recording the dead, um, and more. I think uh, we talk about an enormous amount of stuff and really very little about music equipment, um, which I think will say a lot about the conversation. Um, and I just think, I, you know, Robin obviously has a tremendous kind of catalogue and he's done so much music. But I think the, th the thing that's kind of the most mind blowing is what is not immediately obvious when you first meet him, but when you get talking and you talks freely about this stuff about his archiving sort of proclivity his his he is an astonishing archiver basically and robin has got i'll you know i'll let him speak but um when you hear about his diary and when you hear about um the recordings that he has gotten made um over the years and that he still has everything uh, you know when, before we recorded this he showed me around his incredible home um, and he has just got everything, as in he's kept everything. He doesn't throw things out. Um, and so it <laughs> became necessary, perhaps, from to buy a big house in order to continue archiving things. Um, obviously, now he has an enormous digital archive as well, um, and a great amount of equipment and some awesome choice pieces. He's got Aphex Twins, old Buchla system, just sat there, and <laughs> lots of other incredible devices, as well as an absolutely world-endingly large Eurac modular system that can truly be called a monster system, because if it fell on you, it'd kill you. So, um, without any further ado, I think it's time that we have a chat with Mr. Scanner. Thanks. I mean, I've worked in many different spaces and I think I've lived in many cities, not many, but I've lived in cities where it's always about compromise, mm. where you live. I mean, light and space and 
books, for example, yeah. to me are really important. In, people can't see, but there's another mirror of this shelf over there, and there's lots more in the di- in, yeah. the, in the distant, in far, the far, distance, far, far distance, from the other side of this Hello. vast factory. <laughs> and uh, I'd reached a point in my life where I couldn't buy another book because I honestly didn't know where to put it. Yeah, and it's an absurd situation. And I, you know, to, to, when you live and work in the same space. For myself, certainly, I need light. I'm not somebody yeah. who's ever worked in music studios and enjoyed being in dark spaces with no windows. In fact, I find them quite stressful when I go into studios, yeah. actually. You know. Well, the closed off aspect, just, just yeah, being in the absolutely. gloom. And, yeah. you know, for largely electronic music, it, it doesn't really matter as much. And I've read lots of interviews with artists over the years and see photographs of their amazing studio mm. spaces. And quite often, they're in quite open spaces like this. Yeah. I'm not sure if people listening can hear a reverb. I can kind of it hear is, a It reverb. will be echo. You will yeah. hear it. Because it's... You were talking about, like, you, you're probably going to convert this room into being the studio space. Because yeah. you're, like, up... You're up in the sort of attic in this kind of... I am. You know, it's a light space, but it's quite hemmed in. Um, I, I, yeah. I have, like, romantic ideas about those wicked pictures from, like, Germany when they were recording. And they've got, like... An, big rug and then like an organ and uh, mm. like a little organ station on one bit and then another space, another little pulpit where you can have uh, just that idea of spreading out and just having different spaces just seems hugely appealing. Well, it's interesting. So, Somebody recently offered me a, a really beautiful old organ and I thought, I could have it. I can, I can actually. <laughs> I have, I, I've got more spaces to put it. I don't know quite w- what I do with it, but yeah. I can actually own this thing. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not about being boastful, but it's about having a space to breathe, you know, and you mm. wake up. The light is beautiful. This is an old textile factory. So the light is there from about five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And at this time of the year, up until like nine, nine thirty, which is such a beautiful thing to deal with, you know. Yeah. And light in cities is, is a rarefied commodity. You know, you pay more for more light. Penthouses at the top of buildings are more expensive for one of those reasons, you have an outside area and you have light all around you. Mm. This is magnificent because it offers me that. It's not in the metropolis. And in fact, that's even better. Yeah. You, know, you can vaguely hear through your headphones traffic yeah. in the distance. But where I used to live was constant. I mean, I used to have these young lads would park outside my window. Always at the moment I went to bed, always when I'm going to sleep. Yeah. So no matter if I'm going to bed at 9.30 or 11.30, they'd always arrive in their car and just party. Yeah. To the early hours. But actually, I mean, it's, it's not, not to ramble on about it, but no, it's the in, space in, in, one which, in, one, in which one works is so essential to yeah. your contentment, you know, and to make work, I need to be reasonably happy, even yeah, though yeah. lots of the work I make is quite melancholic. Well, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's dark music and it's <laughs> sombre and it's full of emotion, but I don't, it's that thing that, um, you know, people say, oh, you've got, to be, you've got to be sad to create, you know, create it. Mm. I think that's just nonsense. I don't think I, those I, people who say that can ever have created anything. No. If, I'm the least creative if I'm miserable. Well, I sit and write poetry and cry in the <laughs> earlier part of each day <laughs> to, to get many into that mood. Yeah, many one hours. One till five. No, no. I mean, I've, I've always been drawn to, to work in, in that sense, that kind of character. It's interesting because I recognise that a lot of British creativity, a lot of kind of British folk music, a lot of British poetry and literature mm. has, been, has been kind of wrapped around ideas of melancholia yeah. and loss. And in some ways, I'm sort of one little strand of that along yeah. the line, you know. Uh, for me, what's always been interesting is, is the heart, in a sense. I want people to feel something when I've made work, you mm. know. I want them to be moved, angry, sad, whatever emotion it may be. I want them to feel something. I think one of the, the, the biggest cautions about res- responding to work, and often, often digital electronic music, is that you don't feel anything. Yeah. You have great admiration for the shapes and the character and the, uh, the structure and the historical aspect of it, perhaps. But what do you feel about it? Yeah. And I think that's really important. You know, and music is great for memory. It's, it's a great resource for storing memories. And so much of the work I produced tries to resonate with those qualities, you mm. know, so it, it tries to engage in a relationship with the listener that actually moves them in a strong way and draws them in, you yeah. know. And there are various techniques one uses for that, not directly, but there's ways that one does it, you know. And for me, I'm a terrible 
musician in a traditional way. <laughs> yeah. you know. Do you mean as in playing? You as can't in playing. Play I mean, when I, when I moved here, you know, you, you'll have a, a, a guy will help you carry in, you, you know, the removal men oh, came yeah. and <laughs> they, uh, they brought in the keyboards I have yeah. and they'd say, come on, mate. Play the tune, mate. Play the tune, mate. Because <laughs> what's that Billy Joel one? What's that Billy Joel one? And then you try and distract them with another joke and they forget, thankfully, but they, yeah. they expect you to sit there and start jamming yeah, with this other In another dimension, there's a removal man. Oh, come on, play the scanner tune. Come on, yeah. play the scanner tune. On. <laughs> come on, mate. Nice reel to reel. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, electronic music in that sense has been the great saviour. Yeah. You know, because it meant I can, yeah, yeah, I can play, but I can, I can save myself before it reaches the public generally. But how do you get the emotion into it then? What's the trick for mm. that? How, how do I <laughs> make my music valuable? Come on, mate. How do I get the emotion in it as well? Can we play a bit of emotion, mate? Uh, I wish I could tell you. Uh, I've got a, a, a fan club you can join and yeah, all the yeah. secrets, they come in a newsletter oh, that's every the, seven yes, years. You yes, get this newsletter yeah, yeah. that tells you. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, my work has often been reductionist. You know, it's often been, there's only a minor key that exists in all the work I do. Yes. You know, the major key, I'm allergic to it. And, you know, I, what I tend to do with nearly all my productions is take a lot of things around me and often reduce them to something very, very simple. I mean, I'm writing a piece at the moment for an installation that will be revealed in Scotland in yeah. Fife. And... I made quite an elaborate arrangement earlier this week, listened back to it yesterday and threw it all away and thought, no, this tells you too much. Yeah. So I actually just played live a kind of a bit like a harmonium church organ sound, played this thing, no quantizing at all. And to me, at least afterwards, it sounded quite beautiful, mm, really far quite, more emotive. Yeah. Like, and it was yeah. it was about that moment. What I tend to do is use the door. Uh, which is Ableton Live in these circumstances. When I say yeah. the door, it always sounds quite quirky. Door, I yeah. use the door. Not no, that door, no. the one that we got in by. And uh, I, I tend to, to use it in a way that's just like a very sophisticated tape recorder. Yeah. So it allows me to store these things and I can edit them if I wish. But in fact, on this, I very rarely, rarely edit them. I come mm. from a background of having to commit to tape. That scary moment, mm. you see the red light comes on and then you start making all the that's mistakes. It, done. But I, I like that risk. And I like playing something that isn't tidied up. I, mean, I read this great interview with the group Young Fathers this week, and mm. they said nearly <clears> all <throat> their tracks tend to speed up at the end because they record them live. So the guy's doing the percussion, it's not sequenced, and yeah, then he yeah. gets faster and faster. But I love that aspect when you listen to it, you know. Yeah. There's a raw energy to it. And I sense that one can feel that when you listen back to it and you mm. experience it. You know it's not simply quantized and everything is really tidy. Yeah, because you've left the capacity for mistakes to be in there. Yeah, absolutely. That much more human, yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, it's just like all music that's, that's been sort of homogenized and excessively quantized, it's, I don't know, yeah. Although with that said, I do, there is something to be said for the robotic nature of like the drum machine that I no, think is deeply sized. Absolutely. There's, there's, yeah. the, there's the great restriction in a sense, I find, of stri sticking straight to the grid. Yeah. That can be quite thrilling. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm struck sometimes, particularly with dance music, because I've grown up with electronic dance music for years, is what I've always enjoyed is when you're, you're hearing a piece coming through and it's going like... And some, very uh, another, very, uh, very good, isn't it? My <laughs> beatbox career is really <laughs> going to take off after this podcast. Uh, and uh, let me do that again, just in case somebody needs to sample it. That's great. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so uh, you can use it if you wish. Thanks. Full, full copyright permission oh, given out. But it's when like another percussion sound comes in, but it's completely opposite to what I might imagine. Mm. And for a moment, it kind of trips you. And I really love yeah, that. I heard, discovering where the downbeat yeah, is I heard a, meant to be. I heard a track this week, just like a Stacey Pullen kind of techno track that someone was playing on the... Uh, uh, YouTube or something and this other post came through and I thought wow mm. and you know you can see for a moment the audience who are kind of tapping their hips to this kind of really getting into it suddenly for a moment and suddenly they switch back into it it's fantastic yeah. when that happens yeah, yeah. you know I've had that where you like listen back to a melody and it's it's the psychology of where the downbeat is and then suddenly if you concentrate hard enough you can make yourself realise the downbeat is in another place and it completely mm. changes the melody do you know what I mean where it's it's very odd. Um, Your doctor recommended you. Yes, do this. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I was also, this is sort of a slight segue, but I was trying to understand, I mean, this is slightly related, is why does the kick and snare create a forward momentum? Why does having the snare on the two and the four create 
forward momentum? Answers on a postcard yeah. to this address. If you can answer this yeah. question, we'd like to hear from you. A million pounds. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Why does that, why does that work? Why mm. does that work? I can't answer that question. No. It's a good question. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, why does that, that trick work? But it does. Well, thank, thankfully, we have a thing called the internet where people yeah, yeah. can write underneath. If only there was yeah. a solution, yeah. was a solution to yeah. discovering it. <laughs> So, we have a speech bubble you can put in at this point. Yeah. 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 What, um, what was I going to ask? I was going to ask, um, because uh, there's lots to talk about, obviously. You've had a very, I say very long, very short career. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, son. Kind of, um, you've had a, you've got a career, you've like done so many different things. Um, you know, uh, I was kind of, obviously like your name, Scanner, refers to like this idea of, of listening to the airwaves and stuff. And I, there's a particular aspect of that that fascinates me, mm. uh, which is um, the whole thing of like EVP and instrumental trans communication, this mm. idea of speaking to the dead mm. through the use of like radios and the airwaves. Mm. And I don't know what I, I don't, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I truly, I always want to believe that stuff is real. Mm. I don't think that the examples that we've heard are real, but they, nonetheless absolutely fascinate me um and i wondered what your takes are you've yeah. got that rowdy book haven't you or, yeah or, i've got you, quite a collection of these, yeah. these books over what's the years what's your interest and been in that and it's uh, i can touch on it in, in, in so many directions actually it's, it's interesting for me because when i was a, a teenager i uh, i remember listening to a record i was given at christmas by my mother Brian Eno's On Land. Right. So this was around 1982 cool something. Mom. Yeah, she was cool pretty mom. cool mum. Pretty cool mum. I also got her to buy Throbbing Gristle records. <laughs> just the very idea of my mother going into a shop yeah. asking for Throbbing, throbbing Gristle. Throbbing Gristle, please. <laughs> or I have three Throbbing Gristles. <laughs> uh, so what was interesting about the record, I'm not, if you, even if you're not familiar with the record, it's, it's in the line of kind of ambient music that Eno was doing. Actually, it's one of my all-time favourite records. It's, it's kind of landscapes in sounds set in Cornwall largely really beautiful <clears throat> what was interesting to me was there were all these voices buried under the surface of the record and I remember listening to it probably on Christmas day or Boxing Day returned to it the next day there was nothing there there were no voices and I thought oh my god I'm really going crazy I'm 15 16 years old is this really it and in fact it turned out it was the citizens band radio of the girl who lived around the corner talking to her trucker boyfriend cb radio so Amazing. any breakers on the one four yeah. this kind of thing so what suddenly had happened was the hi-fi i had was picking up like a sophisticated radio receiver their transmissions yeah. and their transmissions were also going through our television set i didn't realize and what was called a, a radiogram downstairs where we listen to records yeah sounds really old-fashioned but that's what they were actually called yeah and it was yeah, a first tiny glint of voices mixed inside you know, other music in a way. And EVP fascinated me because from a very early age, I was really interested in magic, mm. as in conjuring, yeah. prestidigation. Yeah. And I can still do magic tricks. Maybe we have time later with yeah, yeah. some magic I tricks. I love magic tricks, absolutely love and them. And so uh, I have, <laughs> on the other side of this building, a large collection of books of history of magic. Yeah. And I was fascinated by Houdini. And Houdini absolutely adored his mother. And when she died, he wanted to make contact with her again. Wow. And so he started <clears throat> to visit spiritualists and all kinds of people, which led him into a career of basically debunking spiritualism. And it was absolutely heartbreaking because for this guy, he wanted to believe that these, this voice coming through that somebody would deliver to him mm. was in fact his late mother, but he realized it was a, just a charade, the whole thing. Yeah. And interestingly, there's a, a guy, he's still around, I think, called the Great Randy, this yeah, really yeah. old musician, yes. uh, old, old magician. Yes. And uh, he's followed a similar pattern. He, you know, his, his career uh, uh, has been also largely focused on debunking these myths of people. Yeah. Yet the subject is fascinating, the very idea that you can use a simple technologies like this to pick mm. up these voices. So I've made a number of projects. In fact, the grandest one I made is with the, the late American artist, Mike Kelly. Now Mike uh, was from Detroit, passed away about five years ago. We made a piece called Esprit de Paris, which is you know, about the spirits in Paris. So we went to Paris and we recorded all the most haunted places. Mm. So we went to Edith Piaf's grave. Yeah. We went to the apartment where 
uh, Jim Morrison died. We went to the apartment where uh, Serge Gansborg died, went to all these places and recorded in them. The interesting thing is the guidelines to record in these ghosts from beyond are you have this beautiful equipment, but you never switch the microphone on. Yeah, yeah. Because ghosts don't need it. They just basically they impregnate just get, themselves. Just somehow do it yeah. by magic. So we were then led to a very surreal situation. We were in the basement of a Centre Pompidou in Paris and with an engineer, and we had a pile of blank DAT tapes and videotapes, by the way. We also filmed in these spaces. And then we imported them into the system. And we would sit there for the duration 60 to 90 minutes, listening to these DATs of... of complete silence. But they weren't. And that's what was really intriguing, because we would sit there, and every now and then you'd have this kind of... These tiny noises, which obviously were the ghosts. And we had the same on video. You'd watch the video back, and every now and then there would be this kind of shuddering colour would suddenly appear on the screen. Now, it's, it's, it's easy to argue these, this is a fault in the mm. machine or the tape. If you want to believe, it's something it's else. You know? for you to believe So what well. we did was spend some time editing all those sounds into a composition, mm. which then became a very elaborate installation that was shown then at Centre Pompidou and then at uh, the Macbar Museum in Barcelona. And interestingly, at the moment, I'm actually returning to that work. I'm going back to Paris mm. later this year to reconfigure it so it can go back on permanent display nice. in the, in the, in the centre. But those ideas of voices kind of being out there, I, I find, you know, what, what's really beautiful, I think, is the early part of my career was largely focused on these found voices, i.e. these indiscriminate signals that are pulled down from the ether. And... The romanticism of it really appealed to me that you and I are sitting here, but we are completely surrounded by other stuff mm. all the time. You can hear it now. Yeah, yeah. It's and if, stuff, you, right? if you just have that tool, which was a radio scanner at the time, and you ch tune it into the correct frequency, mm. you can suddenly hear these moments. So if I tune it one way, I can hear the bus driver talking to someone. If I tune it another way, I can hear people talking in the hospital and the pager systems. What I focused on were people on their mobile phones having their intimate conversations. So I was entering a space that you couldn't otherwise ever enter. You could actually hear people's mobiles. like in oh, a, You could hear everything. In, yeah. in an era where they were not encoded or scrambled. No, them. no. So this was still analog days, of course. Yeah. So uh, you could hear everything that went on. You know, So you, you, most often you'd <clears> hear <throat> both sides of the conversation, sometimes only one side. So then mm. you were led to kind of fill in the gaps. What's interesting for me is that I started to get even more focused on the gaps mm. because I didn't know what that person was saying. Yeah. So you start to project into that silence because all you were hearing perhaps was somebody saying, really? Is that? No, they couldn't. They, oh, wow. And you think, what did they do? Yeah. So you'd start to fill in the gaps. And to me, actually, the kind of sounds around it became equally important, had equal validity. Yeah. And that was quite thrilling to recognise that I'm using these as kind of musical tools within these kind of sound beds of ambient, experimental, industrial, electronic music. And both the, the desired sounds and the undesired sounds had equal merit. Mm. You know, I'd grown up, thankfully, fortunately, listening to figures like John Cage. And so I knew of this embracing of the world around you. But it was a revelation when I realised for myself it really had meaning yeah. as well. But also the fact of the intimacy was really important because there I was making electronic music that perhaps didn't have a central focus because electronic music doesn't always have a voice, for example. So I introduced the voice in some ways mm. into that kind of landscape. Amusingly enough, there was just a, a reissue of the composer Holger Tsukai, who was in the mm. band Can. Yeah. And uh, they reissued a box set of some of his albums, which I have. And somebody reviewed it and they said, this, this record release is proof that uh, Holger Sukai is Robin Rambo's grandfather oh, nice. <laughs> because he was using radios and voices and all these, all these kind of transmissions. Yeah, and for me, it's beautiful because even today with the modular setup, I have a module that allows me to tune to the radio mm. and I will often just leave it running underneath without just any editing. The background, yeah, yeah. Be without, because you don't know where it's going to lead to, yeah. you know. And most of my records for the first 10 years of my career... I just hung a microphone outside of the window. So at the final stage when everything was being mixed, 
I would always leave the channel open. Mm. And I'd just bring it up and down randomly, not knowing what was coming in. So every yeah. now and then you get somebody shouting or a car passing by. I love that kind of aspect yeah, because it's, it's, it's very rare we ever listen to anything in isolation. You know, there's always something else happening mm. around you. And I tend not to wear headphones when I go out. I tend not to listen to music, but a lot of people experience music in that way. So for me, it's always been quite fascinating to, to make work and then also consider how people are listening to it, how they're consuming it. The end user, how is this music being projected into their space and how mm. can you play with that? So going back, the EVP stuff is really fascinating in that way, that you can consider this idea of voices and kind of print them on the tape or inside the recording. The classic one for me, I was on uh, Artificial Intelligence 2. If you're not familiar with Artificial Intelligence, it was a, a series of releases that Warp Records put out that featured young pop artists like Aphex Twin yeah. or, or Tekka, all these guys, you know, these little upstarts. Yes. And uh, putting out this kind of fine music that was, you know, very innovative, especially at that time. And my track is the kind of hidden track on volume two at the end. And I love the fact that we put it on the end because we agreed with Warp that wouldn't it be great that you sit and it's kind of you really chilled out, mm. you're mellow on this record and you get to the end and suddenly this voice starts speaking to you and it has these very low frequencies. And what I did was record a speaker breaking. I had a very broken speaker so I recorded the sound of it kind of flapping mm. and then I played very low resonant bass through it and recorded that so when you listen to that recording on the end of artificial intelligence what you're hearing is a recording of a speaker breaking which leads you to think when you're listening to it that your, your speaker's speaker breaking. breaking yeah so <laughs> I played all these kind of really odd tricks and in fact yeah, yeah. that entire record that, that that track came from my second album inspirationally called Scanner 2, uh, all, the, all the audio was, was run through a synthy, uh, mm. EMS synthy. So I took very banal sounds of the street and voices and kind of processed them and treated them through electronics. It's the story I've told many times now, which is it's the same synthy I was offered for 150 pounds afterwards and said, nah. It's a bit much. I, I didn't have the money, number one. Fair I honestly enough. didn't have the money. Literally, if you don't have 150 pounds, never, it is too much. I never had the space for it and thought, <sighs> Why would I want this junk piece of plastic oh, that makes all these weird noises? Do I regret that? <laughs> <laughs> there are many regrets. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's interesting, that question of EP, EVP, and just the, 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 this notion, again, of when you move around, we're saturated by radio signals. Mm. I mean, there's a great scene in the film Contact, if you've seen it, and the open sequence is this wonderful collage of going out into outer space. And the sound design did a magnificent job on this. And mm. there's, there's this notion, which I really love, is that you can't stop voices going out No, they're there. all just, they're just carrying on so into the stars. by the they? time this is broadcast, I don't know, we might have reached Mars. Yeah. But it would just keep going. And I love this idea that if you travel fast enough, you can be just ahead of it and intercept it. Mm. So if we go fast enough, we could hear the speeches of Mussolini yeah. if we wanted to. It's just, you know? the, and the, like, just spreading out. Yeah, yeah, it's remarkable. It is mad. It's... Um, but it's inspiring those kind of things. I, I just right, I, yeah. I love that idea that the, it's the invisible world. It's it's this idea that as we sit here now, this room is not empty. This room is full, mm. and it, it's full of radio of sounds mm. of radio sounds. Of, and like obviously, we have like Wi-Fi now, just to add another layer that's like making me worry that my mm. head is getting cooked by something, you know. But what an interesting thought! It's just all around us, and it is the closest equivalent to to sort of ghosts. It's mm. it's another dimension. But it's, it's there and you can tap into it. Mm. Um, it's that, you know, I've talked to other folks with that idea of by tapping into the radio, you're making music that can only be made in that place at that time because mm. that's, you're just, it, that you're was, just yeah, relying was, on the, the chance. That's been particularly yeah. important to my uh, productions, actually, which is I often felt that when I perform live, what I always wanted it to be was a reflection of that moment. So mm. I'm not a touring artist in the traditional method, which is you make a release and you play those tracks and people who come to the concert are happy to hear those, you mm. know. I'm a great disappointment in that sense, you know. So what I've tended to do is improvise a lot. Yeah. And the radio voices for that period of work, particularly when I could just pick up the live signals, were very exciting because I could arrive in New York and play a concert and the content, the vocal content of the 
performance was picked up live at that very moment. It wasn't mm. happening a minute before the show, yeah. and it's not happening in a minute. It's at that exact moment that you're there, and you are experiencing it at the same time mm. I am. And that's yeah. what's really remarkable, because I don't know what is happening. I don't know what to anticipate, you know, which made it a problem when I traveled in countries where I didn't speak the language. Oh, so I'd be doing you this. You would allow you know, things that were just wholly inappropriate yeah, so, in yeah, broadcast. And I, I broadcast some quite outrageous stuff without realizing it. You know, people would be laughing tearing up, or laughing like, like or crazy. Like, yeah. yeah. Without, without me, with me just standing and thinking. That's not a good, like I can imagine you just like looking at the audience and everyone's cracking up. Oh my God. I'm you like, check your flies oh, are done, no, you know, all yeah, those kind yeah. of things. Like, yeah. Like, flies are intact. Yeah. It, was the, it was that. Oh, shit. But that's what, that, that, you know, so at that, that time, particularly, I started using this term sound Polaroids because I felt mm. they were a little bit like in the past when you took a Polaroid, which maybe lots of people don't even, or aren't familiar with the idea, you take a photo. If I took a photo of you now, it would take a good 30 seconds for that photo to begin to emerge through mm. the emulsion. And so for a moment, you're staring at this blank slate in a way, and this image starts to appear. And to me, that's what I really love about it. That, that image is catching you at that moment and it's slowly formulating itself mm. into a shape. So the performance work for me at that period was very much about that. And interestingly, to jump forward to today, the use of kind of modular and Euro rack and these kind of tools mm. in terms of performance are exciting because I don't really come prepared. You yeah. know, I don't have a set and I have admiration for people who spend ages putting a set together and working out Same. the kind of shape and development. Yeah. But it also doesn't personally, for my own work, interest me. You know, I like taking risks. I really like, I like the fact that a friend of mine went to see quite a popular uh, uh, electronic musician and said, it was awful, the concert. Mm. Because you didn't know at that moment whether the performer was going to be, she could have done a great show or a terrible show. But for that night, for them, it didn't work. And I thought, but that's great. Mm. Because it's not... The same thing that's so this, happening. But this was an artist who is improvising when they Yeah, each play. time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I thought, to me, that was quite thrilling. That you, you know, I think for the audience as well, they can sense that you're focusing because you're also trying to work out where to take this, to use that cliche term, journey mm. in a way, you know. And I find that quite thrilling so still. So you've, you know? you've basically designed your live modules are all improvisational. Systems. Yeah, completely. You you, what, and I, what do you prepare? Is it, do you have some sounds or is it, yeah, are you see, still using radios? And like, the only thing I have is I have a Qubit Electronics uh, sampler, mm. basically. Is you know, the Nebula? Oh, is it Nebula? No, no, the, no uh, the, um, the Wave. Wave. And okay. Wave is beautiful. You know, it's, it's high quality. It's spacious for no matter how big your fingers are. Mm -hmm. And... I can put lots of stuff in there. It's quite funny. I have a, a video online of me playing live and I have a piece of paper sitting next to the case and somebody commented and said, is that your set list? In fact, no, what I tried to do, I thought I'm going to write down what each of the samples are. Hmm. I forgot to look at the piece of paper. I During got the so whole thing, you were just enjoying fascinated. Yeah. Finding out what they might be when you turn yeah. the dial. And so I yeah. have those, those sound sources and everything else can be something. I don't have sequences written in, hmm. you know, I don't, I uh, to what extent do you use chance in melody creation? A lot, yeah. yeah, a lot. So, you know, when something like marbles, mutable instruments, marbles came out, you suddenly think, wow, this is, I like anything that offers more freedom. I mean, it's, it, just to give you a context, it's quite funny for me. My interest in Eurorack and Modular is, it reflects a very early interest in the works of David Tudor, American composer, a musician. Interestingly, at Superbooth this last uh, this year, they had a two-hour lecture on David Tudor's work right. on, on the, I don't on know the Friday all, night. Yeah. So, if you ever had the fortune, and I did, to see John Cage works performed, they'd often be performed by David Tudor. Right. David Tudor was the smartest-looking guy: white shirt, black tie, black jacket, very slick, bold glasses, just looking like a cool dude. <laughs> He'd sit at this table and it would, it's worth just searching for photos of him. The table would be filled with these objects that he built and soldered. Generally in identical looking tin aluminium boxes mm -hmm. with cables and wires everywhere. I, I first saw him when I was about 14 years old, live, perform with the stuff. And I went to every talk that John Cage ever gave in London until he died and went to talks by, in fact, went to a talk with him and David Tudor, which is quite amusing because I, I used to record everything. Mm. And I took my Walkman along and recorded their talk, but they both spoke really slowly oh, no. like this. 
So I played my tape back and it was pretty much blank nice. in a way which is kind of perfect. So Tudor used to have these objects, which remind me a little bit of the Coma electronic boxes they mm. brought out recently. Field got, kits. Yeah, the field kits. Yeah. And my thrill when I saw the field kits announced was, wow, it's like a mini David Tudor kit. Is that kind of know? the thing he was doing? Is it that sort, those sorts yeah, of tools? Yeah, kind of building these kind of small little oscillators and filters and all kinds of things and rooting them so they kind of self-play. So I admired that stuff for years, but with no tech technical knowledge of how to build those or where to even start, I didn't know what to do. And they weren't commercially available. No, no. There was, you, there was no Coma Electronic. No, there wasn't, unfortunately. No, yeah. none of the guys that we rely on today. And, you know, cut through to today, and it's up, you know, absolutely thrilling, oh, I find, that outrageous. you have these yeah. sonic possibilities with all these small boxes, be them in a case, or be they self-contained at times, like guitar pedals, for example. And they suddenly offer incredible potential and possibilities. And to me, that's what's really inspirational, mm. actually. And so I still, I still, in my head, I'm still seeing David Tudor. So when I'm playing my concerts, I can't possibly, you know, uh, uh, parallel his kind of skill set or anything, but I can project myself into this image of being the man standing, or, you know, the, the person mm. standing at a table making this stuff happen, you know. And I mean, the stories are, are, are quite amazing. There's a, a great book written by a choreographer that worked with them for 20, 25 years. I just finished reading a few months ago. And she tells the stories that even into his 50s and 60s, at the end of the performances, Cage would stand there on stage and be booed with mm. David Tudor. People would hate boo, it. Boo it. Why and did you go to those concerts? I mean, surely... Because, because he was going in like... Because it was contemporary dance. People right. were going for the movement. I and see. the movement was being accompanied by this music. And for myself, it's quite interesting. Can you hear that incredible low? Yeah, what is that? I think it's a spaceship just landing on the top was. of the building. Yeah, yeah that's it. They're coming <laughs> through. Yeah. Uh, it does look like a spaceship yeah. at the other end of this. Uh, it's a shame they can't see this. No. Uh, <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it's remarkable with... Uh, I lost my train of thought there with the David aliens. David Tudor, and yeah. people were booing, basically. Booing. People were booing them. But, yeah. Whoa. Uh, but you know, really, really interesting because people were coming for contemporary dance. Now, I've made a career out of scoring contemporary dance right. since 1996, 97 was the first piece I made. And I generally make about four pieces a year. What I really love about that work is... I get to make work for an audience who aren't interested in the music. Mm. They're interested in the movement and the design and the lights. The music obviously has a value, of clearly, but they're not coming along necessarily for the for music. The music. And it means you have an incredible can, can freedom. Can you basically troll them? <laughs> like, <laughs> just sort of do... I find it phenomenal, actually, because you know, it means that you, your potential for reaching people... For example, I just wrote the music to uh, a piece with Dutch National Ballet. Right and Ish Dance Collective in Amsterdam, which toured across the Netherlands for about 30 dates. So 30 dates with about 2,000 people a night with electronic mm. music. Yeah. I've got a premiere that goes out soon with the BBC Concert Orchestra, which is going to be electronics, as in modular synth, with a live orchestra, mm. which will be broad nice. broadcast by the BBC Radio. I feel like I cheated somehow to get there. I don't yeah, know quite yeah. how I arrived yeah. there. <laughs> And yet, at the same time, you think the potential for that is phenomenal. But dance is, is a great way of opening audiences' ears up. I mean, I had one of the best reviews of my career last year in the Daily Telegraph newspaper that began of a, of a choreographic piece. It said, I would rather have my fingernails pulled out than ever listen to this music by Scanner again. Wow. Show sold out. Wow. All the other shows sold out. Wow. And uh, dance critics aren't always the most generous souls. You know, they haven't clearly come for the music. And uh, what's interesting about that piece was uh, the opening was about 16 minutes long of sub bass. Oh, nice. Yeah. So the entire building, the theatre, shaking. was just vibrating. Oh. Yeah. And nice. you were feeling it through your bodies and the whole seat mm. and the, the rack seat, everything was shaking. And what it did, it just opened out. It kind of flowered. Mm. So the rhythm kind of opened out and then closed again. So it was fantastic, actually. <laughs> but I, I, I was told a great story by another piece I worked on recently, which is really funny, for, with an Australian choreographer. And they said the prize of the evening for the premiere had to go to the technician who heard something vibrating in the building. So he dived 
underneath the seating and lay across the seating oh, just for the duration rattling. of the night Incredible. because it might be a distraction. I thought, that is, that give is, that man a medal. Yeah, that's you know. Uh, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to possibilities of presenting work to audiences that kind of challenge them as well, yeah, yeah. in a way, I think, you know, and a modular system has been a very capable, portable way of taking that, that removes me from a screen, that removes me from going like this, and gives me a greater challenge. Yeah. You know, my, my greatest challenge at times was, well, I get RSI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now it's, it's habit when it's yeah. habit breaking and you know obviously folks haven't seen but in your studio you've got like eight or nine different modular synths that mm. you've almost custom designed to each do like do different things be mm. a little different system so on a you know quite easily you can suddenly set up a whole different set of parameters that, that will suddenly challenge your notions of how you're supposed mm. to use that instrument or it's that idea sometimes I've wished I love that you know the website modular grid where you can mm. reorganize modulars but in a way I'd wish that I could just push scramble on my actual modular because by by if you could just close your eyes and the real machine just reconfigured would it suggest use cases for combining modulars mm. that you would never put together do you know what I mean like True. as in my own when I'm designing it I start thinking about I'll use it for this I'll use it for mm. that but I like the idea that actually if you could randomly place them, if you had systems that were all just differently arranged, mm. it would stop you from being habit forming. Yeah, I go through. I go through moments. I mean, I've yet to have one case I've done two shows with. Mm. I strip it after oh, you the always show. Change it yeah, after completely. The show. So, and even now, I set one up for a show in London that got cancelled. So I'm going to strip it again. The show mm. never happened, and I've got other thoughts of how I'd like a show to go next time. Right. You know, I've got a morphogene, make noise morphogene on the mm. way, which has led me to think in a particular way and I thought if I connect it with the cubit nebulae and I connect it with a kind of reverb and I try this with the intelligent rainmaker even if these mean nothing to people listening to this it's about it's about taking bits on a puzzle and thinking I wonder how this what will if, work what if, what it's, to me the, the best analogy is like a chef you know mm. you have all your tools you're both your cooking tools and all your spices and everything and you think I could make this amazing meal in this way or let me move over here and I'll use these other things and do it in mm. this way and so I I have these other systems because they have different voices. They offer very different ways of thinking, yeah. actually. You know, yeah. when I move from using a Buchler system across to a make noise, then to my mutable instrument system, then to the Verbos system, whatever they may, may be, they all have quite different ways of thinking yeah. for me. And they've yeah. been set up in a way that I, I work in a different way. And after anything I do, I take all the patch cables out as well, just so I can't so do, do you, it again. Do you start on... I can, I've seen you play. I can't remember if you patched. I think you had patched the system before you. But it was at the uh, Rossius thing and Peter. But yeah. Do you? Is that normal? Or will you literally start with it unpatched? I've done a few shows where I have absolutely nothing patched. That's right. Yeah. There's one That's show I brave, did with John Leafcutter hard. in London, which you can watch online. The video if you search right, right. for it. And that was really brave. We both turned up with cases, and we had absolutely nothing. And we said, okay, we're going to run a clock. Believe me, once you listen to it, there's no clock you know, right. in existence. <laughs> And this thing is just this wild sonic journey. And we had great fun. Yeah. What I loved about it, we had people standing all the way around, like a metre away, fascinated. By just watching, watching what was happening. Watching these two boys basically play with chemistry, almost mm. like, you know, it's incredible. Just this thing was happening. I had no idea where it was going. Yeah. It's interesting because when, once things are recorded, you have an opportunity to kind of analyse it and, and, and think about it. Because once when you're doing something live, you're not quite sure where this is really going. And certainly I know that some recent concerts I've played, I've stood there and after five minutes thought, I have no idea what to do now. And I'm standing yeah, there thinking, I've, I've had that. if I <laughs> do that, and it's interesting, I saw uh, the Italian uh, performer, Caterina Barbieri recently. Oh yeah, 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 she's awesome. She's a phenomenal performer. She is absolutely brilliant. And what I loved about the show was there was a certain point, it's this beautifully melo melodic sequence well, happening. Yeah, she does this gorgeously melodic stuff. And then stuff. it all collapsed. Oh. And I spoke to her afterward, and she said, oh, like this. And I said, that was amazing, oh, because your vulnerability came through, yeah. you know. And I love that about that moment, yeah. you know. And to me, you suddenly go, there's a human there. This isn't just playing back. Yeah. And it can go wrong. It can go. Yeah. Like I saw, a, I was watching a, a boiler room for my sins of uh, Lego Welt playing like, amazing techno. And it's just like, just, it's like peaking. It's so good. And it's just like, da -da 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 -da. and it's total silence in the room. And every, the whole crowd just kind of, <laughs> everyone almost throws themselves yeah. to the side because they've lost the beat. And he's like, what the hell? And it's uh, just the big, all of the PA system had just cut out in that moment. It wow. just gone, 
total silence. I mean, and I really felt for us, I was like, mate, I would be mortified because, yeah. you know, all your power is taken away from yeah. you, basically, you know, and at that moment where you've been building and building and building and building, yeah. you know, you've just got to, you know, try and claw it back. It's interesting but, that building because I have a tendency with many of my works. I read an interview years ago that said one thing that's very bad psychologically to do in music is never to give a release to people. And there was a Peter Gabriel record that was out in the 80s. I can't remember which one it was. And there was a pause in the middle of the record. And they said it's really bad for listeners because they think something's gone wrong, you know, mm. on the radio, et cetera. And it led me into wanting to do things like that. <laughs> so many tracks I've done that use rhythm tend to keep building up and up and up. And the intensity builds and they never release. They usually just stop. It's really annoying. Mm. You know? <laughs> Don't ask me what I'm like in bed. <laughs> So you do troll people. I do troll, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I mean, it's like these conventions should be played with. It's just like, it is difficult though. In the case of making dance music, it's, I was talking to someone yesterday, I was like, the problem with dance music, the scary thing about it is it's, um, it's an analogy I've not really thought of before, but it's like being a, a stand-up comedian. It's like, if you, people don't laugh, You've failed. Mm. There's a very, very, very clear goal that you must hit. And it's very immediately obvious. You can't fake it, really. Mm. You can't make people dance who don't really want to dance. It's, and just in that same way. So it's, yeah. It's it, funny. I played at Cream in Liverpool oh, in 1998. Oh, wow. I have the, the dat in my archive here. And I, I decided at that point, all people need, I thought, <laughs> all they need is a kick drum and a hi-hat to go back to an earlier conversation. I think you're probably absolutely nobody right. Nobody does. Oh, nobody does. It was an absolute disaster. Oh, I thought, really? I'm going to do this thing literally just going like... It's like kind of minimal compact yeah. techno. <laughs> With nothing, did you have literally nothing else? There was nothing else. else. Oh, you literally? Literally had nothing else. Okay. No. And all I did was <laughs> kind of just move the mixing desk, the kind of filters around, put echo on things. And mm. it, to me, it... it, it it what, was were, you, basically were you saying, making a statement of some kind? kind? Of, yeah, I didn't, like I didn't want to play there, quite obviously. No. They, they invited me to do it. and <laughs> Did they invite of, you back? <laughs> yeah. No, they didn't. Funnily, enough, they didn't. Funnily enough, my dance career never even took off <laughs> yeah. after that. And uh, curiously, a journalist earlier this year said to me in an interview, he said to me, this French guy said to me, I have to say... Uh, your rhythms are the worst rhythms I've ever heard oh in music. <laughs> so, flattery will get you yeah, nowhere, mate. really. Yeah. Wow. So uh, they're not that bad. You know, I've done no, a few kind of rhythm really pieces and I've heard far worse. Yeah, so. but exactly. I like the idea that, wow, well, just a kick in a snare, a uh, kick in a hat. Yeah. Yeah, I might try that. I can play the record. I've got the dat. Or yeah, the, yeah, that's good. It was about 30 to 40 minutes long. I can't, I still cannot believe I, I dared, you had I dared say yes and I had the and audacity to And you dared to, to actually yeah. be that simple. I don't think you need much more than a kick and a hat, though. I think you could get away with a kick and a hat and one, like, oh. Yeah, just like, you've got a bit of sub bass. But I suppose it depends on the audience. It's like, it's hard to know. I'm and what time you're playing. What time, and I'm, yeah. I'm terrible at that. Like, but I'm, And I have been a fallen foul of sequencing before, where, you mm. know, I've been... Someone's put put my sort of like strange modular techno after like a hands in the air kind of someone playing Fat Boy Slim, okay, and, yeah. and the room is absolutely jumping. But everyone's having a great time, and then then I come on and I'm just like doing improvisational strange. I've, I've like, had periods. I did a show in <laughs> Switzerland in about 97, 98, and I arrived thinking it was a kind of outdoor rave party. So I'd prepared all this kind of very funky stuff. And at the time, I was travelling with a uh, quasi-midi quasar synth. Oh, yeah, wow. What had happened to quasi-midi? Closed down. The guy. Yeah. I still, still yeah. have this quasi-midi. <laughs> it's a great synth for what it offered. And I remember turning up with, with that and an Akai sampler. The weight of that alone was overwhelming. Mm. And I turned up and basically it was all elderly pensioners sitting in seats. <laughs> so all I did basically was not use the sampler and I just used the quasi-midi and did this kind of ambient... I ambient basically played this kind of poly. funky music without any rhythms. And it worked very did well. Did they enjoy it? Some Who knows? They probably couldn't hear a thing. <laughs> <laughs> probably asleep for They're like, mm, good most of base. That's all yeah. we can hear. It's probably about four in the afternoon, anyway. So. That's amazing. Funny. Yes. Wow. So, um, what was I going to talk about? God, there's, there's, there's a lot of different things. Um, yeah, I should probably ask you a question at some point. Um, Did you ask me a question yet? I'm I don't think sure. I have. No. I, and I asked you about uh, ghosts and. Oh yeah. Too, anyway, we had a. That was a question. I was hoping then we could c convince Zarina to put a white sheet on her head. Yeah, yeah. Just like she could just yeah. sort of drift past, like. Yeah. Off a, like you know CG yeah. some stuff in yeah. After Effects. <laughs> One thing that I've sort of and I've talked to other people about this just because it's something I'm trying to. I, I don't have an explanation for it in my case, but where does. In your case, can you attribute your interest in electronic music to something? Is there an, an origin that 
you know, mm. something from your past that, what, that gave you a proclivity mm. and what were your formative electronic music experiences? You know, I can point to something quite specific, which I only realised in, in more recent years, mm. which is a tape recorder. And my analogy is that today, pretty much everyone has a mobile phone and they take photographs with no intention of being a photographer in a kind of professional way. Perhaps they share them on Instagram or Flickr or wherever. Mm. But there's not the notion of, I want to make my living with that. And for some reason, my family had a tape recorder. And we just used to record everything. Mm. So I don't know why we had it, but it was this fat, portable, plastic thing that probably cost 20 pounds with big batteries in it. What I used to use it for when I was around nine or 10 was recording Spider-Man off television. Mm. And video recorders hadn't as yet been invented. So I would put the tape deck or tape recorder next to the TV set. And then I would read the credits. So it would go, Spider-Man. And I'd read all the names and everything. I have these tapes Amazing. later on, if you wish, I can play these very <laughs> Because I'm a great archivist. So I yes. have all of this stuff. It's quite remarkable. And I started to record us having dinner. Oh, wow. At home, or my brother watching football on television. Because you could, you could store this stuff. And I realized quite quickly that they were like photographs when I was like 10 and 11. And I had a great music teacher at school when I was 11 years old who played as John Cage. Mm. John Cage obviously meant absolutely nothing to me as an 11 year old in, in terms of who was this guy. But he played the pre uh, prepared piano pieces, which if you're not familiar with it, uh, is a piano where you prepare it by putting nuts and bolts and rubber bands and all kinds of things within the piano the itself. Strings. So on, it becomes a it. kind of almost like a gamelan percussive instrument. Yeah, it makes like incredible sounds. Yeah. You, don't, you wouldn't think it were a piano when you first No, so yeah. we, well, we, I went home and my brother and I, we had, we had a cheap upright piano at home and we took the front of it off and put the tape recorder in there and just hammered. I was going to say, the, it's really annoying to prepare upright pants because you have to lay them on their back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we just thought we just ran things like kitchen utensils yeah, yeah, up and down yeah. because it was fun and you could make sound with it. Yeah. And it was that sudden discovery that there is this other world of sound out there. And of course, at the same time, there were TV shows, kids' TV shows. And one popular one when I was 10, 10 or 11 was using Kraftwerk really okay. early on. Nice. And I can't remember what it was. You can see it on... Uh, 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 YouTube and places like this <clears throat> and you know that that kind of sphere of music that sound was around me and then when I was about 13 my English teacher at school gave me a reel-to-reel -reel recorder and he said look I know you're interested in sound and music Robin so I don't want this do you want it mm, it's remarkable amazing. so suddenly yeah. I went from and what's what's interesting here is the cassette recorder offers you a very linear point of view in terms of recording. So we record, you press pause, you record, you keep adding. If you go back, you go over the timeline and you've lost it. So you're kind of doing, doing this. Hmm. Secret is serial. Yeah, serial. serial, yeah, linear recording. Whereas the reel-to-reel -reel meant I could layer things. Oh, so it was a multi-track reel-to-reel. Multi-track. Oh, so yeah. and what was exciting about that was perversely, it never worked properly, which is why my English teacher wanted to get rid of it. Oh. So the heads were slightly out of a line, which meant if I made this sound, and then I went to uh, over it go like, doom, 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 it would always be off center. You could never quite get it on. Oh, wow. it, the recording heads, there was something wrong with it, so it never functioned properly, which led me just to making more abstract things, mm. just tape loops. Where it didn't really matter where things were Made no difference. Yeah, yeah. So I used to do this thing, which I loved, and I, I showed you these new or old tape recorders I have downstairs, mm. now these reel to reels. What I want to do is repeat what I used to do then. I used to set up a giant tape loop around my bedroom and I used to put a microphone out the window and I'd hit record. And we lived on quite a quiet street, so a car would go by, oh, nice. get recorded on the tape head and go, and it would go all the way around the room and come all the way back around again and go, whilst being added to by the footsteps of somebody. Yeah. Or my mum shouting, do you want some so you, biscuits? You, you sort of disconnected the array's head, basically. So yeah. it was just doing sound on sound. So it just kept going and going. It was fantastic. Yeah, and I'd, nice. I'd leave it for hours. And at the end, switch it off and do the same the next day and just, you know, no, I wouldn't keep these That's things. Awesome. They were just, they were kind of like ambient, D DIY ambient music yeah, you know, yeah. from your own uh, environment. So I can point very directly to things, objects. And mm. then it turned out purely by chance and chance factors in one's life are so exciting when you can kind of remember them is the man who lived across the road from us was a conductor. 
not a bus conductor, but a music conductor. Mm. And I was on the train coming home one day from somewhere in cent central London, and he had this giant book resting on his lap. And it was the scores of Stockhausen he was working mm. on. I'd never seen anything like this in my life. Graphical These scores. Graphical, yeah. colourful, alien landscapes, absolutely magnificent. A world away from me learning the piano at school. You know, mm. There were no black and white notes. It was just words and shapes. I thought this is absolutely amazing. So then I went to the local library where I lived in Southfields in London and bought cassettes of this work. I got confused though for a moment. So I'd heard John Cage and Stockhausen. So I went to the library and I got Stockhausen and John Cale. Oh. That's John Cale of the Velvet Underground. Right. And I thought, John Cale sounds so different than so the other school. It's, so, it's very beautiful. It's like film soundtrack. And it was film soundtrack work. And <clears> I then very sort of absentmindedly discovered the Velvet Underground mm. because of that as a teenager, because I, I thought, John Cage was in the Velvet Underground. This is crazy, you know, because you're, you're young and you don't have, you don't have the internet at that time yeah, yeah, to join the dots. But I got interested enough that I wanted to buy books on this stuff, electronic music. You couldn't find them anywhere. So over here, out of camera shot, all the books that are laying down this way, yeah. horizontal, are all music books. Oh, yeah. So I have this very early Michael Nyman book on music. And at that time, you couldn't just buy a book in the UK. It sounds perverse. You had to buy it from America. But how do you buy a book in America when you live in the UK? Mm -hmm. You have to know someone who's going to this place called America and ask them to buy the book or order it, or ask their family to order it in America. Yeah, and bring it back. It was absolutely phenomenal. I got this book and I still treasure these things to today. Like yeah. all these things have great meaning. So electronic music started to have a place in my life mm. by just acts of discovery, actually. You know, you realize now looking back, because you can see them again on, online, so many TV shows you watched had these kind of things. There's a popular children's TV show, Blue Peter. I remember them having Mike Oldfield, the composer, mm. deconstructing how he made the music for Blue Peter. That's, yeah, that's and that was remarkable when you're young. Yeah. yeah, when you're young to realize, so one man did this. Now today, it's so much easier to do this on mm. a laptop or whatever you want. We're bombarded, like, yeah. yeah I, I remember hearing stories of people like trying to work out how how like the drums were so incredibly perfect on that record, not understanding that they were made with a machine. It's, yeah. like, it's like, oh, right, yeah. I didn't know. And so, you know, it's interesting to, when you start to trace back, I mean, it, it's curious for me because I've kept a diary since I was 12 years That's old. That's actually what I was, I was oh, searching really? yeah. to ask you about. That. Yeah. I, I didn't make a note of it, but that's- Should have brought them here to put on the I know, table. It's like, that is remarkable. So just clarify this, you've kept a diary f for how long? I'm 54 now. Yeah. And I began when I was 12. Every day. Every day. Never you missed, a, missed day. a day. No. Is, ever. It's truly phenomenal. <laughs> and I why did you? Why did you? St I started because I was given a diary for Christmas. Well, there you go. It was a BBC. Better keep it. Better keep yeah. a diary then, hadn't you? My mum gave me this diary, BBC Radio One diary. So it was only, you know, it was about this big, and I had nothing to say. Like, school was fun. Played football. Queener at number one. Had chips for dinner. Amazing. Life it's enhancing still. information. <laughs> yes, indeed. And after two or three years, I want to say after 20 years, <laughs> extended. <laughs> no, after two or three years, I bought bigger diaries and bigger diaries. And now they're always written in fountain pen. Yeah. Never biros, never typed. I prefer the feel of fountain pens. I was brought up to use these pens, so they're always handwritten. Yeah. And they map every single day. So I can literally, you say to me, that concert you went to in 1982, in Hammersmith, what, what, what was that like? And I can say, hold on, I can, I can go and look Two it seconds. up for you. And it's been really useful. For example, I wrote sleeve notes or contributed sleeve notes to a King Crimson record release and a Terry Riley release. And both of them, I could go back to my diary. Because you had it written down. Is, yeah. What, uh, do you write a lot in how much, you know, how many about, words per day? It's that size, size of your, right. your book so like, But you would write a page of... And I've got small writing. So it's about 500 words every yeah, day, something like this. Day. And always do it at the end of the day have never ever missed a day, no matter how tired I am, how sick I am. I've been in hospital and I've woken up the next morning and done it in the sort hospital. Of, retrospectively, just yeah. to keep, yeah. Uh, it's just, it, uh, it's interesting because I never, I never considered anything about it. You mentioned it to someone else. It's like, you don't brush your teeth? What yeah, do you mean you don't brush your like, teeth? Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, and I, I can completely get, it's such a valuable thing to do. Like, 
I can't, it, it blows my mind because it's, we all know we should do something like mm. that. And it's so vital. Like the times I've kept a diary in recent memory, like we went to Mexico and like, that's where I proposed to my girlfriend who is mm. now my wife, my wife. And, you know, I kept a diary every day there and that, that was just, Two weeks. Hope she says yes. Yeah. Hope, she says yes. <laughs> Hope she says yes. She hasn't said yes. I haven't yeah, asked her. Yeah. She said yes today. Um, <laughs> she said yes yesterday. And um, it's, you know, even just within that two weeks, I've forgotten so much. Mm. And so much of that holiday, you know, and, and, and when a holiday is all about the memories that you mm. make on it, it, I, I can I, like not that long ago revisited just reread it. I was like, oh my god, I forgot about that. Mm. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Amazing, and it instantly comes back. That's the thing. That's that the scary thing is because yeah. it is in there. Yeah, you do remember. I'm sure there's things that we forget, but it's remarkable how much we can remember it. I've heard it described that mm. memory is like a pencil, in that you have to. It, it's a weird analogy, but basically like a pencil where if you can grab hold of the eraser and pull it then you get the rest of the memory. But you need that initial trigger mm. to pull, you know, to access the mm. dendrite or whatever. Don't ask me it. anything about before I was 12. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't have a clue. it's all the land. Yeah. But it but is interesting because, amazing. you know, I, I don't have any family left at all. There is no mm. one who has any memories of me younger, a couple of school friends, but nobody who grew up with me or has any of those kind of family connections. So these books are the only way I can access that time in a way you mm. know and it is a kind of time travel you, you i do look at it every every now and then i mean once a year i just randomly yeah, pick one up go. and i look at i think what's the date today the 24th of june or whatever it yeah. may be and i look it up from 25 years ago or 30 years ago what was i doing on this day and it's and you remember it that's what's really funny genuinely you always yeah. remember it and i always write the, the time at the top and i always write where i am so it's quite nice looking back and i can just flick through it and it says Bar, you know, Berlin, Barcelona, Paris, just flick over mm. the pages and think, oh, oh I did what that. was I doing in Paris then? And it's also really funny because I've also got in boxes uh, every flyer from every show I've ever done from about 1982, all, all lined up. That's so amazing. I can draw on this stuff quite quickly. And again, that's quite interesting because then you can suddenly look at flyers and think, wow, I did that show with Orbital? Yeah, yeah, did we yeah, really do that, really? guys? Yeah, I don't remember, did. yeah. You think, whatever happened to my career? I was doing these big yeah. shows. Yeah. Where, where is this like, thought to archive in such a Where does that mm. come, spring from? I don't know. I've always done it. So. You've, always, you've always collected things. Yeah, or if you imagine it... like, what, what you see behind you are... A bookcase. Bookcase. But I started buying these when I was about 14 or 15. So you know, each one of these is, is a memory of a place I was at mm. or uh, mostly they're exhibitions I've seen. These are all monographs of artists. So from the top... Up there you go from letter A and we're up to That's P. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Of course. And over there it goes from P to Z. Then there's my, all the... my wife does it by colour. She oh, really? Does, she does colour archiving of books. So they're, they're really... I used to work in a library, I have to confess. I worked in a music library and a child once came in and said, Mister, why don't you put all the books in colour order? And I said, you know, great idea. But <laughs> somebody comes in and says, I'm looking for that, you know, Mozart score. Which say, edition? Because yeah, it, it matters what is that, colour madam? Up. Yeah. So these, the, these are, in a sense, are my memories. You know, I can pick them out and they're great resources. And they take me through certain times. Books go out of print very quickly, mm. you know, so... Especially I like, you know, art books, art, art books yeah. and things relate to exhibitions. And if I... Now, I learned many years ago, if I don't buy that book... The sense of regret is awful, you know, really, really, because I, if you, if you three months memory, later, yeah, well, three it. months later, you think, I wish I'd bought that. It could be out of print. And mm. books can go up from being £20 to 2000 very, very quickly. Mm. And people may think modules are expensive, but, but books, and, books can be very valuable. Yeah. So in a sense, these are, the memories are here, it's but these the, are also great trigger points. And so I've always been a, 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 yeah. always been a very kind of organised person. And this may be of no interest to people whatsoever, but I put down some of my success, in inverted commas, to be inefficient like mm. that. I often am complimented on the fact that I'm very responsive in terms of emailing yeah. or answering interviews or whatever it may be. Because I always think, OK, I dropped that pen on the floor. Do I pick it up now or do I pick it up tomorrow? Let's pick it up now and get that done with. So I tend to try and do things, mm. you know, uh, immediately. I grew up at a time when... My family were broke, to be honest, so they, they didn't have the money to buy nice cameras or anything. So the only photos I have of me are on holiday in August, and generally my head is chopped off because my mother wore glasses, and when you wore glasses and use a kind of analogue camera, 
people will testify to this. You, you don't see through the lens properly. Yeah, you, 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 you don't was, frame it properly. Parallax, so yeah, we should have just, filmed this whole piece with my head slightly yeah, yeah. chopped I'll off. I'll just ref I'll You can do it. that. I'll yeah. Crop it off. <laughs> uh, but it's quite funny. So I have lots of photos where I'm headless. When I say lots. I don't hardly have anything. You of know? you. Yeah, and that's yeah. what's interesting. So there isn't really anything. So maybe it was a way of me wanting to store my own history in a sense. You mm. know, with with with, with, with sort of nothing else to, to, to catch it in, you know. And at that time, you know, one couldn't just take photographs like we can take today. And like, you know, my hard drive and my laptop is filled with thousands and thousands of photos. Yeah. But I can probably point to 30 of me as a teenager or something yeah. like that, something like that, and that's it, you know. So in a way, it's, you reflect yourself by, by keeping the memories. Of yeah, and I'm, I'm very, always been fascinated by ideas of memory and how memory works and... How much do we remember is our memory, or how much it's formulated by people mm. telling you stories that that's always yeah yeah you fell over and you yeah, hurt you like, you know I, I have was, this scar here yeah my memory is that well I know what happened I had my head shut in the door <laughs> one of my family came to the door uh, I ran to the door the door slammed my your kid your face is kind of made of rubber your nose gets caught uh. my lip got caught and it ripped it open there I have this image of my sitting on my grandfather's lap and he had a white shirt he always wore and just his shirt being covered in blood red did it really look like that yeah. or is this something i projected through film and mm. cinema and, and people retelling the story yeah. to you does that matter i don't know but those kind of things kind of fascinate me yeah. in the way that you know music is a way of storing memory it's argued that the music you listen to from the age of let's say 14 15 to 1820 those kind of formative five or six years stay with you to this mm. day. So mm. that music, you, you know, that you could play me one of the tracks you loved to listen to when you, know, you were that age. And I go, this is awful. It's orbital, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's not awful. Okay. But, you know, there is, there's, there's, there's music that, you, that would resonate with you. A hundred percent. That would not resonate with others. Yeah. You know, it's, it's quite interesting like that. It's, so it's a great way of storing memory, I think. Yeah. It's a challenging memory when, it, when it's incorrect, like the... We talked to I mean, that is incredible that you have like just the reel to reels of like a dinner with your family as mm. well, especially if your family are gone. To have that, yeah, a, a, a time capsule to I have one preserve of, yeah, voices. Especially. My brother's twenty first birthday, so I would have been uh, six, fifteen or sixteen, and he was twenty one. And it's my brother, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother, and me. And I'm the only person there and they're all giving their messages what I think is phenomenal is actually I kept all those cassettes even mm. in moving home all those yeah. years and you can't see but over there in the corner there's a box of CDRs and it's got all my everything I've ever recorded so I have in the basement all the DAT tapes yeah first floor or second floor I have all the CDRs and upstairs are all the cassettes and yeah. I have all these kind of uh materials archived in different ways i actually digitized the cassettes a couple of years ago with a couple of uh, interns digitized all the stuff the poor poor people poor women had to, uh, yeah, to experience dress. all this dross i don't think they listened to it they just watched the levels on the yeah, machine and like, got to the it's end still doing something yeah an algorithm could be trained to... but i don't regret it for a moment actually no, there, I, there were... I think I, I, did you see it's part when you showed me that you know those reels and you were talking about it i, I remember basically that I have this, my equivalent to this is only, it's not a record that I made, but um, although I have subsequently, basically as a reel to reel that was in my grandma's, like um, just under the stairs in a cupboard, um, in her sort of last years, you know, we found this, this, this box, it's full of tapes. And basically she, she's Canadian. My grandfather was in the RAF. And he went over to Canada to train pilots. So they would, you know, go over and he would, he would teach people to fly in Canada. He met my grandmother and they fell in love. And mm. basically, um, you know, he brought her back, basically. And then what I learned subsequently is that for her to kind of keep in touch with the relatives in Canada, they would send real to real recordings they would just do a little mm. almost radio show where it's like oh, this is what I'm up to it's like this like mm. us talking now just just record a whole thing this is what we're up to this is what we're doing and then post it over presumably and it's I mean this is what is breaks my heart presumably a number of those tapes are still over there or were like overwritten and sent back of course. but point is we've got I've got one of these tapes of them wow. and it was it was like Christmas 1964 and in it is my father as like a 
12 year old boy talking about his school day and there's my uncle who is even younger but the main point is it's my grandmother you know who's now gone and it's her listening to her early voice because she was canadian mm. when i knew her from 1983 onwards she was oh. sounded more english but she sounds a lot more canadian and now the main thing is my grandfather who mm. died he died in 1968 so long before i was born and i've there's no i've never heard his voice except there is this reel to reel i, I remember I got the tapes and I, we were talking about it. I got um, a reel to reel off of Free Cycle and I spooled it up. And, you know, there was this moment where I hit play and there's some choral music and it was a recording in the school chapel. And then it fades out and then this wow. room tone fades in. I'm like, oh, we're in a room now. And then suddenly there's this voice that sounds like this slightly plummy kind of sort of RAF y voice. I instantly could hear my dad's derivation from this wow. word. So I was like, that's, that's my grandfather. And, and it was, and it's- How amazing. So, yeah, just to, and then just to hear them, him. Mm. And it, it's remarkable how much, you know, it's one thing to take credit. This is the thing that kills me is that the, you know, we've all got a mobile phone in our pockets. We've capable, we've got an incredible archiving tool mm. on us. And we could, at any moment we take pictures and we love taking pictures. But we could be recording audio and video. Mm. Video is hard because it uses so much space, but audio doesn't use very much mm. space. And through audio, you can really get a sense of a personality. It gives mm. you a sense of how they were. You know, tone is everything. Absolutely. So, you know, it doesn't take much to get. No, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yesterday, I got a message via LinkedIn online from a dancer yeah, I worked sympathies. with. No, this is, no, <laughs> That's no, a good thing. It's a good it's thing. It's quite funny. Just uh, LinkedIn a, a dancer I worked with back in 97. And uh, she sent me this message and said, uh, can we WhatsApp? But she doesn't want to talk on it. She, doesn't, she sends me recordings. Oh, no. So she sent me a recording. Little, like, yeah, she, so yesterday she said, here is the sound of Inside My Car and Birdsong. Brilliant. Is, it's quite brilliant. fantastic. I thought, wow, this is, this is the way this technology mm. could be used, but people yeah. don't, obviously. And people, there's a number of artists over the years who've set up kind of websites and projects where they record you record your city, I record my city or my home, whatever. Mm. And they're quite beautiful. If anything, what I like about them is they encourage people to listen. I think, you know, there's a really interesting thing about recording, which is as soon as you press record in some way on a machine, mm. you start listening in a different way. Yeah. And I think that's what's really interesting. I'm working with some young people in Scotland at the moment on this project, and I'm trying to teach them about recording in a sense and how there's a responsibility when you hit the button, but also how it makes you listen and act in quite a different way. Mm. It's really curious yeah, like that, is. you know. You know, if you're surreptitiously recording, you're cap capturing the real moment. As soon as it's recorded, like now there's a certain formality to mm. a format of people talking because you know... We know we're on record, yeah. but it'd be very different if we didn't, you know. Yeah, and I think that's quite... You'd probably swear a lot more. You're very good at that. No, I do. Just, I like yeah. to swear more when I'm yeah. on record. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, I, I feel bad because you've often you've chastised me for joke. swearing. Joke, yeah, swearing. Joke, yeah. I had to make sure that I marked these podcasts as explicit because <laughs> they are sometimes. But, but you know that, know that, that way, again. So. You know, it's really. I think that idea of memory, the idea that the way that the concept that music stores memory is really, really. I mean, important. I was going the one once return very quickly on Please. that with that reel to reel. The amazing thing was then playing it because my, you know, my dad was very affected by his father's death. You know, my dad was only 23 when his dad passed away um, and had not heard his voice since the day he died, mm. you know? And um, it was interesting, I, I went to him and I was like, I've got a tape of like him speaking, I've got your dad. Um, and he didn't, you know, he was obviously reluctant, kind of, it's a tremendous emotional weight of having to listen to that. But he kind of had a moment where he was like, go on, put it on, I want to hear it. And, and he listened and he was like, no, you're, you're playing it at the wrong speed. He said, that's not right. He sounds, his voice is deeper than that. It's got more resonance and weight. I'm like, well, I can hear Gran and I know what she sounds, mm. you know, I know her pitch, I, I don't need it. You know, she's almost like the tuning fork mm. for me. Um, and I, it, it was playing at the right speed. It's just his memory of, yeah. of the gravitas of the man has changed and colored how his memory of, of his voice is that, mm. that an accurate recording, an absolutely accurate, you know, representation of his voice was wrong. But the memory wow. was, I don't know which is right, you know, is the memory right? It reminds me, because my, my father died when I was a teenager. 
just before my 16th birthday. And he died in a horrendous way on a motorbike, a testing it for a TV show, a BBC TV show. He was a journalist. And that moment was recorded oh on tape. God. There's the consideration that somewhere out there, there's probably still a recording of that moment, the kind of before and the actual moment. Not something I wish to see, but I find that a kind of an astonishing thought because I have no recordings of him. I have maybe two photographs. That's it. You don't you have know. his voice. Nothing at all, no. And yeah. I can, if I were to hear a recording, I'd probably recognise him immediately. Yeah. It's many years ago, but it's still... Can you still hear him? There. Can you hear his... Yeah, in some ways you can still hear that voice. It's interesting, but... Yeah. Uh, I think maybe that's also what encouraged me to want to keep storing stuff because I realised I didn't have anything of him. Mm. And interestingly, actually, to, to sort of go back to a question you asked earlier about discovering electronic music, I was left £400 when he died, so I bought a guitar and an amp and good, that led good, me into... Good, good use. <laughs> good, wasn't it? Yeah. I also I spent inheritance money to yeah. buy my first music equipment. And that well. led me into basically doing lots of things I do today. Yeah. I still have that amp here. Oh, nice. And it's the cheapest kind of like seven watt amp, but it sounds fantastic. Yeah. It's dirty and old and analog and horrible and dusty and nasty. It's quite fantastic for mm. what it offers me. Mm. It's nice. So, um, I mean, there's, there's lots of other things we talk about in terms of process and mm. sort of things. It might be nice to talk a bit about machines mm. a, a touch. Like, do you, you know, in a more general sense, there's sort of two things is generally how has your process changed over the years for the better? What have you, what can you look back over, you know, the sort of five or six years that you've been making music and, and say that, you know, oh, that made the biggest difference, that yeah. improved, you know, that marked an improvement or things that you've learned. And, I, and then the other thing is, you know, what are your favorite pieces? Just as a touch point mm. to talk about what's good about certain bits of equipment mm. and ways of working. I suppose, you know, that the first big step was the Atari ST computer mm. was a way that meant I could play things on a keyboard that would somehow magically go into the screen and I could return to them the next day and they could do the same Still thing. There. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it wasn't as easy as that may sound because MIDI in those days was a very raw and difficult challenge I found actually. I st I've <laughs> maybe today it isn't any easier, you know, but... It hasn't uh, changed. It's no, still the same as it was Maybe the understanding of it, one's yeah. appreciation of how these things function. Uh, but I suppose, you know, screen-based technology, when that took off, was really liberating. Mm. You know, the speed of things, the way it could store things, the memory. I bought... I've always had portable recorders. So I spoke about the, the machine my family had, this big thing. I bought a, a recording Walkman. Mm. I have a drawer upstairs, which is like a, a museum of recording devices, all the ones I've had. And I went through to mini discs, I went to portable DAT machines, mm. all these kind of things. They've all been ways of me being portable. And I think the portability became very, very important. Today, I will actually use an iPhone with a Rode microphone attached yeah, you got to the it. IXY, yeah, yeah. And it works perfectly. Why, you know? why portable? Sorry? Why, why, why is portability important? Because I'm interested in storing sounds from elsewhere. You know, I will be in Berlin in a cafe, go to the toilet and think, wow, that air conditioning sounds amazing. I'll mm. be the guy standing there when you go to the loo with the recorder. My, the server room at my work sounds exactly like an Eliane Radig tune. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there like, we are. Yeah. Totally get where you're so, uh, so, you know, that kind of technology was, has been very liberating, that kind of mobility of being able to do things. I know I could do multi-track recording on that and I can do yeah. it. I'm not really using it in, in that, You're more, in that you're more way. as a capture device. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that ability, you know, and the miniaturization of technology. I mean, to consider that when I first played live concerts in my professional career, which would have been 94, 95, I went out with a Yamaha synth. I went out with a Roland sampler S1000. These things weighed a ton. Mm. The flight oh, the case... Big, did you have the keyboard, the big keyboard? I had, yeah. No, I had a Yamaha SY22 keyboard mm. and another one. That's a, I actually quite want a Yamaha oh, really? SY22 and a TG33. I sold it, I sold it with a uh, flight case for £30. But in fairness, they're not going for a lot. That, that's no. what's, this is a bit of a sort of underground tip, is that SY22 and TG33, mm. those are badass sound. Yeah. Like, they're really amazing since. But I stopped using it and it just sat in a cupboard enough. and I thought, yeah, but the thing was so heavy. It yeah. didn't... It, it didn't encourage me to want to use it, yeah. you know, just from the sheer scale of it to go out and do shows. So I, I sort of got recognised for a time. I used to have a half-size record case, which had a Mackie mixer, a Yamaha sampler, 
a Roland PMA5, which was a very early touchscreen. I was one of the first people, I think, using this kind of touchscreen technology in right. terms of live performance. And uh, I had that with lots of cables and a theremin and an effect, a boss effects unit in this mm. one little case. Oh, nice. So it'd be this small mobile unit. Like this sort of portable kind of Yeah, I take a backpack. Gun. And, yeah, you basically. Could just go and play, play shows anyway. I mean, I could really, I could go to, you know, play at any festival or gig very, mm. very easily. And that became the kind of system I used for years and years and was very inspiring because it could be, you know, the sample had lots of sounds, but I could make all kinds of loops on it and do all sorts of things. Then I got into an idea of just using mini discs inspired by a friend called Bernd Friedman, otherwise known as Non-Place Urban Field. And uh, his work is, is fantastic you know, rhythmically. And I basically stole his idea, which is that you use lots of mini discs and you, you have rhythms all recorded at the same tempo and you just press play and see what happens. And just let them phase and sort yeah. of do strange things with and each other. And yeah. there, was never a, there was never a kind of single pulse. Yeah. It was always kind of things that were suggesting to kind of... And then you just have a mixer and just fade, yeah. fade and then you, things yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. And it was great because nice. you could build these things up, you know, over mm. a period of 30 to 40 minutes. So that kind of technology was, you know, quite important. The screen, I get bored with the screen very quickly, though. That's my problem, you know. And I, my interest in using things like modular for many people is similar, which is it's about engaging in a process of making music and too much of my life is spent in front of a screen, you know. They, they, it's argued that the mark of any success is that administration takes over your life. I must be incredibly successful. <laughs> I, not really, but I seem to spend so long doing admin. Mm. And when I have a chance to go to the studio, you know, it's a great liberation yeah. away from that. But do I really want to stare at another screen? Mm. It's a bit tiring sometimes. Mm. So much information comes through this shape. You yeah. know, our news, our entertainment, you know, when you switch off the... the or is it, is it just the, the, the way that information is arranged on the screen, you know? This, well, sort of the one thing that came out of this last um, podcast talking to Olivier is this interesting idea he had about just going back to graphical scores. Mm. Could we be using computers to create graphical arrangements mm. in ways? You know? No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it was interesting considering that idea. I heard that and I thought it's kind of what the... Uh, iPad has enabled people to do, where you can kind of draw on them more. Mm. You can have this tactile relationship. And I think for those not interested in using modular synths and Eurorack systems and everything, you know, a, an iPad in itself is a way of having this very tactile relationship with an object and actually moving things around. You can use cubes and shapes and draw on them. And I've, I've used and played with these kind of things. I get bored of them a bit quickly because yeah. it's another screen, you know. Yeah. And I want for myself, when I sit down with a guitar, the sound that I'm hearing is the result of me doing this with my fingers. Mm. If I don't enable this process, I'm going to have to cough, sorry. Go ahead. <coughs> if I, yeah, thank you. If I don't enable this process of doing this, then there's no sound that comes through. Mm. But it, I have an immediate body relationship. Yeah, it with, is, it's a, a brain to sound. Yeah, it is. Brain to and sound I think that's what's very, very rewarding about when I play, when I travel with my synth here, yes, you know, nice I do my shows. Got uh, I've got one half the size of this, which is much more <laughs> yeah. effective to God, travel technology is yeah. incredible. <laughs> and uh, it is that relationship about here, your ears and your brain, and how these things are all working together, you know, in a very mobile, operative way. And technology has been a great enabler for mm. me, you know. I've used it to make works where I'm, I'm doing orchestral works. I can't really write scores, mm. I'm not very good. I work with a fantastic arranger and she helps me to tidy up everything at the end. I've got a reasonable idea of what range each instrument can take. But then for the piece I did for the BBC Concert Orchestra, she said, <clears throat> it's not physically possible for them to play it like this without breathing for 10 minutes. You know, I thought, what's the problem? I can do it here on the keyboard. Uh, so we just have to slow the thing down and hope that the no, poor guys who have to play this breath. can like... <laughs> And play this thing but you know it's a great enabler in in terms mm. of possibilities mm. i find you know uh, i would not be able to do most of the stuff i do were it not for technology yeah for form. that technology actually and yeah. i'm still incredibly enthusiastic about it about the possibilities of it what it's brought to me what it brings to other people i'm working on a project at the moment which is a very important project which is about soil with a scientist an artist 
which is trying to bring an understanding to people that soil is so important how we understand it. It's as much as today, if you have no internet, people get frustrated. Mm. If you have bad internet, the image all starts to crack or you, 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 you can't watch a video or you can't listen to streaming music. You know, the change in soil properties changes the whole food pattern, changes our whole world around us. Mm. So I'm working on a project with her, developing a, a, a piece that reflects these ideas. I'm working on a project which will be traveling around the UK as of hopefully next year and the following year, which is looking at low bass frequencies, particularly for people who can't hear or, ha or are hard mm. of hearing, so they can actually feel the frequencies. So I'm interested in using sound to or techno sound technologies to open up these possibilities for new ways of thinking. So it's not only about making a record and playing a gig, which is probably why I realize I'm less interested in playing live shows. We spoke off camera about mm. this. I'm less interested in just following that pattern. I'm more interested in offering something that opens up a kind of thinking process. So the early work using technology allowed people to think about public and private space, these scanned phone calls, is this right, is this wrong? Morality questions, questions about public and private space. And move through to situations where I've done projects that have scored a permanent piece in a, a, a morgue just outside of Paris. So that's a permanent piece to assist people in a moment of bereavement, a piece that offers something more than silence to help people in a healing process. It's a very, very important thing. And I've been drawn to projects that offer something far more than a commercial viability mm. or a hit record, you know. Mm. It's, I find it remarkable. I can kind of sit under the surface and these things can still, you know, make their way forward after 26 or 27 mm. years. So... I guess I think we should sort of moving towards the final question, mm. uh, final solution is, <laughs> um, is this sort of this same thing that I've been asking kind of everyone, um, and we have touched on this a bit, I think we're talking about graphical scores certainly, but that, you know, as, you know, technology has changed, um, you know, although, I th you know, you're still, you know, I think you're using technology in a, a brilliant and classical way as well, or you are almost still doing those things that mm. you would do on a mini, mini disc, but, it's the question about the future is like where, you know, what do you think is, so, is successful about the current state of where we're mm. at and therefore what, where can we progress? What is going to be the next stage mm. in music technology? What do you see the most valuable future looking like? I suppose I can answer it by saying I'm still excited about music technology, which says something to start with, which says that... I'm still seeing things that people are developing and releasing that still stun me yeah. and excite me and stimulate me, make me want to own them to see what I could do with it, whether it's exploring ideas of granular synthesis, which have been around for a time, but seeing how far we can go moving through time. An idea of time travel with sound is always really important. I'm not arguing for a time machine, but <laughs> it could be quite handy. Would be nice. There's a horse I had some, a really good bet <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, could do really well. But an idea that sound is... Sampling was really interesting because sampling and storing of sound meant that we could record something and then we can go back in time, mm. which you, 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 you couldn't do in a way. You can kind of reverse into it. And granular synthesis is a way of doing this. And one could argue for touchscreen technologies and virtual reality and all these kind of things. I would say what excites me most is that I don't know. I can't predict or anticipate, you know. Somebody pointed out, it's really interesting, an interview I made 20 years ago, which I, I wish I had capitalized on it, because what I said then was someone should develop a tool, a, a music playing tool, uh, with a particular format of music. This was before MP3s were widely around, whenever it was. So they should develop a tool where you could only play music in this format. So you have to buy this special thing, which probably would have been called an iPod, and this format of music could only be played on that. Why did, I not, why did I not follow through that thought? Uh, but, you know, I, I like the fact that I can't answer the question, you mm -hmm. know, and that's not being lazy. It's the fact that we have so many possibilities. I think, what would I like personally? You know, would I like flat cables? Mm. Would I like cables that are no longer round? Cables mm. are always round. Flat cables that go under surfaces would be great. That actually you know? is a great suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love that as well. I, if I put that one, can someone please yeah, make it flat? Maybe someone's done them, I haven't seen it. Yeah. It. Yeah. 
So flat cables are, are a really simple, very dynamic uh, future for everyone. <laughs> but uh, I don't know because, you know, I, I speak to people who are using Eurorack systems, modular systems, and we say, well, haven't all the VCOs been invented, all the filters? And yet something suddenly appears and you go, wow, mm. <laughs> that's amazing. Mm. I want that. You know, that really allows me to explore my voice in a whole new way. That's fantastic. Mm. But the fact is, we don't know. And in one year's time, when we look back at this podcast and that guy's made all that money. From the flat cable. That flat cable. <laughs> you <laughs> bastard. <Yes. laughs> when you have stopped doing the podcast and made a because million flat, from flat cable. Flat corp. Yeah. <laughs> Alex's flat court company. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. The fact that I can't answer it is, to me, the best mm, thing possible. It's the most exciting thing. Because yeah. it makes you want to keep making music and seeing what else yeah. is out there. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Well, Robin, thank you very much for your time. My thanks pleasure. For, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. Cool. Cheers. Shall we hit record now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is like, the, you know, on the mini disc. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you have to push the record. <laughs> don't say and that. delete. And that's me and Scanner. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I, I hope you're interested in all that because it was, you know, we don't talk about gear a great deal. Um, and I thought that was just exactly the right way to do it um, because it's just, you know, what a guy. It's just a really interesting dude to chat to, the most chatty and most interesting of people. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and, you know... I've, it's what I said before we started was kind of the the most mind blowing thing about Robin. I think is not the music, but the archiving. Um, you know, obviously his music is incredible. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's just it's what stuck in my craw uh, was this this idea that he, um, you know, that you keep a diary every day since you're twelve. You know, for. I mean, oh God, maths. Uh, do, 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 do. My phone is flat. Uh, so, 54 minus 12. 42 years. 42 years of diary. And I saw the diaries, by the way. After the thing, he was like, I'd like to show you them. Uh, we went downstairs, we played ping pong, and then um, he asked me my birthday and got his diary out. And sure enough, there's the entry for... That date, um, you know, uh, not so long ago, of course, being a spring chicken as I am. Um, but, uh, yeah, wow, God. So um, it got me thinking, and I, I was like, do you know what? That is an amazing thing to do, because the di you know, a diary is your life. You know, it is, you are your memories. You're the memory of everything that's ever happened. And if you keep a diary, then you make it all that much more possible to savor and recall your life not to say that you should live in the past but to have that available as a resource and to go over it every evening i think probably does help you remember your life that much more and so i actually have bought a diary um which starts on july the 1st so um it's like a one-year diary i'm actually going to have a go at trying to do a similar thing or at least do a year see if i can do it that's a good challenge but I'd like to propose a different challenge to you, a task for you to complete after listening to this podcast. Now, there was a moment in the podcast that I sort of alluded to something that I didn't fully explain, which was um, obviously I had this recording of my, my grandfather and my grandmother and my dad and my uncle when they were young. But that recording inspired me at Christmas to take my podcasting equipment that you just heard me using, you see me using, and to when we went up to Yorkshire, where my family are from, um, at one point, I one evening sat my dad down, and me and my dad had a big conversation about his early life, and I basically recorded a three-hour podcast with my father. Um, interviewing him basically about his early years and all the various stuff he's done and it was because of his father doing exactly that although inadvertently using audio as an archiving tool as a way of re 
remembering our loved ones. And you can only do this while they're still here. So here's my challenge to you, which is I want you to sit down at some point with a family member or a friend, someone who is incredibly important to you, and to sit down in a quiet room and with whatever equipment you have available, record a conversation between you. And I don't think it matters especially what you talk about, but obviously talk about what's important to you and what you want to remember. But make time to do it. Because if you don't do it, there'll become a day when you'll regret not doing it. So there is no better time to start than right now. You all have a recording device in your pocket and the quality is irrelevant, quite frankly. Just hit record using whatever app, whatever thing you have and record the conversation and archive it like Robin would archive it because that conversation may well become the most important thing that you possess. And with that, I bid you adieu.